The new microphone, so it will be okay, I promise. Look at you guys. You know what? I don't say this often. It's got to go down. You're going to have to EQ. You get, she's getting there. I don't say this very often, but I love you guys. Really do. Yeah, I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know what would be really helpful? If some of you guys would decide to go to second service, that would be really helpful. <laughs> Super helpful. Some of you young families are not going to be able to do that, I know, because your kiddos got to go to uh, kids' worship when we have it, but um, boy, it would be really helpful if somebody would decide, you know what, I think I could go to eat breakfast before I go to church. That'd be awesome. Or you guys can pack in. If you don't mind packing in, I don't really care. You know, once we get the new foyer built, what'll be great is, is we'll be able to expand our seating out that way, and so we'll be able to add a, f a few seats, and um, that'll be good, or alleviate some of the pressure. But you know what? I like that you guys don't mind sitting close to each other. You know, there's something in uh, ministry called the 80% rule, and they say that once you, re once you reach 80% capacity, that you will begin to decline in numbers because people don't like to sit close to each other. Isn't that sad? I think that if you have a group of people that love each other and want to serve the Lord together, it shouldn't matter, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, we're just going to keep it real tight <laughs> and real balmy and hot. Now, we're working on that. Don't worry. We're, we're trying. It's, you know what? Trying to get stuff built these days is hard. It really is. So... Well, today is an extremely special day. You can see that because I am dressed up. <laughs> I own one suit coat, and this is it. And uh, I, had, I had a bunch of suits at one time, and then when I got here, I burned them all. <laughs> and uh, so I don't have any anymore, except for this one. My wife made me get this one because she's like, you can't go to weddings without a suit coat, or you can't do funerals without a suit coat. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, like, I got the coat, right, because we're going to do a funeral, and, I, and, and we're doing a memorial service, and I got here with my suit coat on. I was ready to do the service, and everybody just dressed normally. <laughs> Nobody dressed up. It was like I was the only guy with a suit coat on. So maybe they're overrated. I don't know. This day is really important to me because we're, 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 we're ordaining a dear friend of mine. And uh, Richard and I have been working together for a long time in ministry. Um, many years now, probably what? How many years do you think it is? Five? Five years? Wow. So obviously this day was way more important to me than it was to him. Because <laughs> he didn't wear a suit coat. He normally does. And what's odd is, is that when he preaches, he wears a suit coat because his mom will yell at him if he doesn't wear a suit coat. And here's mom sitting right here. So I'm expecting some disciplinary action to follow this. Now we're pretty excited today. This is an amazing day. And so this day is meant to be a charge for Richard, but also to give some insight into the life of a pastor, what it looks like. What, what do pastors do actually, right? So I wrote down a list of all the things that um, are the common expectations of pastors. And uh, so we can have a good kind of familiarity of what these, uh, what these ideas are. So number one, preaches for exactly 10 minutes. Number two, condemns sin without apology, but doesn't hurt anyone's feelings. That's number two. Number three, work from 8 a.m. to midnight and also uh, be the church janitor. It's important. You got to do all the things. You got to make $40 a week, wear good clothes, drive a nice car, buy all the best books, and donate $30 to the church each week. <laughs> yep. You know, I had someone tell me that the pastor, we, at one time we were talking about pastor's pay and all that kind of stuff, and um, had a, someone in the church say that the pastor should never be making more than the lowest paid member of the church. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Yeah, that was the thing. It's, it's hard, man. You guys don't realize the struggles and the intricacies of, of uh, 
or the nuances of the politics of being a pastor. It's, it's, it's difficult to navigate. You, you have to sit in it for a while, like Richard will tell you, you know what I mean? It's like once you sit in it for a while, you begin to see it. He has to be 29 years old, but he has to have 40 years of experience. <laughs> he has to have a burning desire to work with teenagers and spend all of his time with the senior citizens. He has to smile all the time with a straight face because his sense of humor is what keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. Make 15 home visits a day and always be available in the office for conversations. Never misses a church meeting and never inattentive to a networking with, that, with other churches while evangelizing the community. All those things. Above all, is always exactly what each and every person wants in personality and attitude 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those are the minimum expectations of being a pastor. It's, it, it is it is hard because like everybody has kind of like this idea of what a pastor is, what a pastor does, what their purpose is, what kind of person they should be. Uh, and, you know, I found that over the last 25, 26 years now of, of being in a pastoral position or in church ministry full time, um, I have found that I have never met a pastor that fit every expectation that every person wants. Never, never. And the thing is, is as your church grows, every person has individual expectations. And so, you know, leveling the field a little bit is what pastoral staffs, elder boards are all about, really, is, is like adding people to the pastoral pool so that a lot of those different needs are met. We have a, a, a philosophy about building pastors here we try not to build pastors with the same type of spiritual gifts all at the same time. We want to distribute those spiritual gifts. So um, everybody has a little bit of a different role to play. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much the administration guy. I pretty much do the organization. Uh, I operate as an executive pastor, more or less. Uh, you know, Richard is our kind of, um, gosh, I don't even know what you are. I don't even know why we have you. And then Ken is coming along. He's our, he's our detail guy. He's like, he's always trying to, you know, make sure that we got all the details covered. He's uh, excellent at, at producing our podcast, um, does a lot of work in that. And then Richard is the extension of compassion that a lot of us don't have, right? With, I mean, Greg. Yeah, Greg. <laughs> Yeah, Greg is the extension of compassion that most of us are lacking in. He is as an abundance of. And so uh, it works out really well, and, and God has blessed it. And, uh, and so we want to kind of take a look at Scripture and kind of look at the qualifications, kind of build upon that and kind of see what it is that God expects, because that's the most important thing. You know, I always tell pastors, you know, it's like, it's not about pleasing your people. You're never going to please your people. In fact, you, if, as, as your church grows, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to tick somebody off. So you're never going to please the people. So don't worry about pleasing the people. Please God. And all that you do, please God. And everything that you do, give thanks to God for what he's doing. Accomplish his will. And then let him take care of the minutia. Um, Pastors spend a lot of time trying to put out fires. I did this for a lot of years, you know what I mean? It's like you, you spend a lot of time going around putting out fires, you know, dealing with conflicts or dealing with little issues in the church and everything. You know what I've learned over the years is, is that if you spend all of your time dealing with all the minutia of all the little fires and all the little conflicts and all the little things that happen, you never give space for people to grow and mature in their faith to be able to handle their own issues. You know, you can give them a little nudge, you can give them a little bit of advice, and then let it go and see what God does. You know, sometimes the best thing that you can do is the least that you can do. Uh, you can get overly involved. And so there, there's a lot of different, like, little I, I, there's no way I could sit up here and tell you what a pastor does in one sitting. It's just not possible because it's different every single day and every single person is different and every single group of people is different and every single demographic is different. I had a guy asking me the other day, he's, he's planning a church and he's, you know, asking about small groups and about all these different programs and stuff. And, you know, it's like, you're not gonna know what to do until you learn the people that you minister to, until you learn your flock 
all the programs that you're going to throw in there, they're going to put them in there, they're going to fail, then you're going to revamp them, then they're going to fail, then you're going to revamp them, then they're going to fail, then you're going to try something else and it's going to fail. You know, and it's just like this, this process of figuring out what actually works. You know, we have a lot of times people ask us, you know, it's like, why don't you guys do small groups like real life does small groups or, you know, like comparing us to other churches and the reason that we don't do small groups like real life does small groups is because we have people that left real life because they didn't like the way real life does small groups. And so that's just the way it is, right? We're all part of the kingdom. We're all trying to do something. We're all trying to accomplish something. And every pastor, every church is trying to fulfill the needs of the various members of, the, of God's flock that exist in this community. And one of the things that you have to understand as we get into this, and, and we, we need to talk about this right away, is, is that when you're talking about pastors, you're talking about elders, you're talking about bishops, you're talking about all those things combined together. Pastor is a relatively new word used to describe what an elder is described as in the Bible or a bishop is described in as in the Bible. And so there's been some name changes that have taken place, but that word pastor is not a bad thing to use because really how the Bible shows us dealing with God's people, he relates to you guys as his flock or his sheep. That's not necessarily an admirable thing, okay? I always wonder about that because it's like, why does God call his people sheep? Because guys, sheep... Yeah, they're, they're not smart. They do dumb things. They're kind of gross a lot of times. Um, they, we'll see here in a little bit. You know, it's, like, it's, it's not necessarily like a glowing uh, commendation from God to be called sheep. But as his sheep, he knows his, 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 his flock, and you are all part of his flock, and he is the shepherd. So the pastor, therefore, is the under-shepherd. The pastor is responsible for taking care of God's flock. You're not my flock of sheep. You're not, you're not, you're not my, in my pasture. This is God's pasture. You are God's sheep, and I'm just here to manage and maintain what he already has and possesses. So that's, first and foremost, you need to understand. And a lot of pastors get that wrong. You know, they, they believe that, you know, this is my flock, and they refer to their churches as their flock and that's wrong right off the bat. This is, you're God's people, you're God's flock. I'm just here to manage it, that's it. And so, as we look in 1 Timothy chapter number three, we're gonna see a lot of the different kind of things of what we're really looking for. Some of that stuff is pretty funny. I've encountered some of that stuff before, um, but, uh, but uh, what we're really, truly looking for. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verses 1 through 7. By the way, if you can't see these slides and you like to have access to these slides, they're on our Facebook page. Also, you can go to our app, and you can go to the sermon um, called Richard's Ordination, and you can look at the PDFs right on your phone or on your tablet or whatever you have on you or your cybernetic eyeballs or whatever you got. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verses 1 through 7. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, and of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if, he, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them with the, which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let me tell you guys, what God requires of a pastor is far more than you require of a pastor. I'll guarantee it. God is very picky about pastors and deacons and what they do and the type of people that they are. And as we go through this list, you're going to find that it's not necessarily about, you know, this is prohibited, this is prohibited, this is prohibited, you must do this, 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 and this. 
Really, the collective is built so it establishes the type of person or the type of character that God is looking for in an individual that's going to serve in this role of bishop. Now, the first thing that he says is that it's a true saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. That word desire comes from the Greek word, which means to stretch one's is to reach out after something, to covet after it, to desire it. Thayer describes it as to grasp something or to reach after or to desire something. The first thing that has to be determined about a pastor is, is do they desire the office? Because if they don't desire it, you have a problem. Merriam-Webster defines desire as this, a long or hope for, exhibit or feel desire for, to express a wish for something. It's like there's this, there's, you know, we call it a calling. You might call it in a myriad of other things, but the bottom line is, is that there is a desire to do that which the pastor does. Because without desire, you'll never make it. I promise you. If you do not desire this office, you will fail. I believe a lot of pastors end up burning out in five years, which is the statistic, by the way. Pastors usually last right around five years. That's the statistic. They'll last, and some of them will bounce around. Like, they'll last five years in one church, and then they will move to another church because it just gets too it gets too ugly. And then they'll move to another church because it just gets too much, right? And so the, 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 the average tenure of a senior pastor in a church or evangelical church is about five years. We've beaten the odds here because we're great at working together and we love one another. So that, that makes a big difference. Um, but there's also a component to that that you have to desire it because there's going to be days where your pastor is going to wake up and he's going to be like, I do not want to deal with these people today. That's just the honest truth. I mean, I could come up here and, and, and tell you that it's, it's flowery and I only really work on Sundays and then all the rest of the days I get to talk to all these wonderful people and everything. Now, the truth of it is, is when people usually come into my office, if they get through Richard and they get through Greg and they get through Ken, if they end up in my office, it's just flat out ugly by that point. And so typically, if something gets into my office, it's really bad. Now, Greg is great at running that screen so that he kind of deals with a lot of the peripheral issues and a lot of those things, so it's really great, but... You know, once you deal with so many really ugly things, there are times where you're just like, I don't know if I want to do this. But that thought, if you desire the office, it quickly fades away because you're just like, nope, I just love doing what I do for God. I mean, in my opinion, I have the best job in the world. Yeah, it's ugly sometimes. The hours are ridiculous. Um, you know, sometimes dealing with people is hard. Organizing all of this stuff is hard. You know, I mean, it's like you guys don't really see all the kind of organization that goes on behind running a group of people like this in the society that we live in today. Right? You can't just do handshakes. There's policies and procedures, and there's organizational charts, and there's all these other things that go along with this, not to mention every Monday meeting with a group of pastors to talk about what's going on as a method of training and, and building up good leaders in the church. I mean, there's all these different things going on. It's a lot of work, but man, I love every minute of it. It can get tiring and you can sit down in your office and you can be tiring and you can, you can look around and you can think, oh man, you know, it's, it's just exhausting. But man, what a, what a life to be able to preach the word of God, to be able to read the word of God with, as, as part of my job description. I mean, that, that alone is pretty amazing, right? But if you don't have a desire for that, 
there's really no point in pursuing it. I've seen guys come out of seminary on fire to do something, right? And they think to themselves, man, I'm just going to jump right into the pastor's position, right? Or even worse, youth, worse, youth pastor. <laughs> and they think to themselves, yeah, I'm going I'm to go in and I'm going to get, you know, a five-figure salary working at a large church and it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be great. And then five years later, after dealing with church councils and business meetings and elder boards and all the uh, people that don't like what you're doing and every little thing that you're doing and every little complaint that you receive and all the little nitpicking that goes on, you know, I mean, dealing with five years of that, usually they're just done. You got to have a desire to do that. You have to have a willingness to do that. And so all the other things that come after that desire are tools that are utilized to be able to help you to do the job that God's given you to do. And the job requirements are these. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Blameless. It's not open to censure. It's irreproachable. That means to be without condemnation. Let me ask you a question. How, how does a man that lives on this earth ever get to the point where he is irreproachable? Anybody know? You have to have Christ, right? You have to be saved. See, the first thing about it is, is that it, 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 if you're talking about a person being irreproachable, you have to understand that the, 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 the relationship with God is the most important piece. If they're not saved by the grace of God, they're disqualified right off the bat. There's no point because you are living in a life of condemnation. Now, there is a second piece to that. After you talk about the salvation piece, there's a second piece to that, that you're irreproachable in the community that you live in. This is what usually catches pastors off guard because they have things in their life that people like to pull out, and then they utilize those things as tools to cast condemnation upon them. We're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. And the thing about it is, is that there's not a pastor walking on the face of the earth that doesn't have something in their past that someone can pull out to utilize to bring reproach to that person. That's just, that, that's just the nature of life. We were, we're all human beings. Just because I'm a pastor does not mean that I'm above sin or that I'm above, that I'm above doing things that are wrong. I'm a human just like you are. I struggle with the same things that you struggle with all the time. Your pastor will never be without sin. If you're looking for that, you're looking for the wrong thing. You're, you're never going to find a pastor without sin. You're never going to find a deacon without sin. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is, is talking about the fact that he must be saved. He must be irreproachable. And the only way a person can be completely without reproach is in the eyes of God when he's saved by the grace of God. So salvation is key. If you aren't saved by the grace of God, you can't even pursue the office of elder. It's done right off the bat. That's first and foremost. The second part of that has to be a husband of one wife. Now, man, there's a lot of argument about this. Is it husband of one wife at a time? Or is it husband of one wife for his whole life? There's even people that think that this piece talks about the pastor of one church because the church is the bride of Christ, and so you're only the husband or, or the husband of one wife, which is a ridiculous notion because Christ is the husband of the church, right? Or the husband, yeah, you know what I mean? So a lot of these things are really bonkers, right? But this is the way that Athel Baptist Church interprets it. You have to be the husband of one wife, period. There's no add-ons to that. It's pretty plain what it says. You have to be the husband of one wife, which means that if you are divorced, it disqualifies you from being a pastor. That's just the way it is. Um, as harsh, it doesn't disqualify you from service. It doesn't disqualify you from being a part of the family of God. It doesn't disqualify you from helping individuals. It just means that you just can't be this position. It's the same thing with, with, with a lot of other things that go on in the church, right? Divorce is a tricky issue. We don't have time to talk about that, but, but it's tough, right? So it's the husband of one wife. So blameless, without reproach, husband of one wife. We're already, like, got really easy qualifications, right? You have to be without reproach, and you have to be the husband of one wife only your whole entire life. Your whole life. Entire life life, right? 
It's a life sentence. You sign that thing, you know, you do the ceremony, life sentence. I won't say that second service because Kim will be here. <laughs> second part, second, first Timothy, and continuing in the same verse, it says, vigilant. You might think that that means being watchful, but it doesn't. It comes from the Greek word, which means to be sober and not be a drunkard. You know, what's interesting is you're going to see this come up repeatedly over and over again. Apparently, drunkenness was a problem in the New Testament church. Apparently, this was an issue because they keep bringing it up, right? So it says to abstain from drunkenness, to remain circumspectfully and sober. So how can you watch the flock if you're laying off in the corner drunk, right? It's not possible. So the prohibition against drunkenness is just like the same prohibition against drunkenness for all the rest of the flock. If anybody here is drinking to the point where they're getting drunk, you're failing. Stop doing that, right? Easier said than done, I know, but that's what we do, right? We live hard lives of moral circumspection and holiness because that's what God's calls for. What you're going to find is a lot of this stuff is just stuff that he calls everybody to do. Tells us to be vigilant. Don't be, don't be that guy that's drunk. You know, be circumspectfully sober. And then that word sober, which follows after that, interestingly, means curbing your base desires or self-control. So it's a little bit confusing. Right? That vigilant word is really about drunkenness. And then when you talk about being sober, which is, we always assume as being the opposite of drunk, it really just means to curb your base desires. It's all about self-control. That pastor must be an example of self-control. He must be an, an example of being able to control his base desires. It's just part of the job description. Which is what we really all should be doing. We should all be curbing our base desires. We shouldn't just be doing whatever we want because God calls us to a higher purpose, right? Good behavior. Uh-oh. Well-arranged modest, orderly. It's like a life of order. Not living your life is a life of chaos. You know, being able to do things scheduled, being able to uh, look decent, being able to be of modest description so that you are acceptable to the rest of the world. You know, this, this, this is, a, is a tough one because then you start getting into the way that people dress and the way that people act and the hair that they have or whether they have a beard or not. You know, this is where a lot of churches get these kind of really legalistic ideas that you have to look this certain way. You have to have this haircut. You have to have this suit coat. You have to have all of your facial hair shaved. You know, you have to, you have to be this certain look in order to be what God qualifies you to be. And so that's why you can sometimes get magazines and you can get a list of pastors that are going to be at this certain place, and then you can see that they all are basically the same guy, right? Maybe saying something a little bit different, but they're all basically the same guy. It's not really about that. It's about not looking so much like the world that people cannot tell that you are a decent person. Now, how do you define that, right? That's the hard part. Well, like I said, it really gets, it's really about knowing your flock, right? Like, it would be hard for me to be modest, to be orderly, to be well arranged if I wore a tuxedo up on stage every Sunday, right? I mean, you guys would get used to it, but it would be weird, right? And, and it might even really throw some people off. You know, like when you start changing things around a little bit and you bring a little bit of disorder into a situation, people freak out, man. They really do. Like if you introduce a new program or you change a program around or whatever, you know, it's like trying to do things in an orderly fashion, you know, trying to be of good behavior, trying to be, you know, well arranged, trying to be orderly in the way that we do things. You know, it extends beyond just the way that we look and basically the way that we act as individuals. It's about how you carry out policy, how you introduce ministry, how you deal with a council of people, how you deal with a committee. You know, how do you go in and are you orderly? orderly in the way that you address that, or are you a railer, or are you an arguer, or are you a yeller, or are you, you know, a passive person that doesn't actually try to do anything to make change happen, you know what I mean? There's, there's all these kind of different ways that, that that plays into the life of a pastor. 
And it's hard sometimes because a lot of times people just disagree with you, and a lot of times people are just wrong. There are some times when Richard is wrong. I'm never wrong. But there are some times when that happens, you know, when you, you have a confrontation, it's like, how do you approach that confrontation? Do you approach it orderly? Do you approach it modestly? You know, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of ramifications that go along with that. So it's not just about the way that you look. Given to hospitality, hospitable, generous to guests. You ever wonder why before service that I come out and I make sure that I shake just about everybody's hand or I'm out in the foyer and I'm shaking everybody's hand? It's because I want to express to you that I really care that you're here. That's part of being hospitable, part of being generous to our guests, people that are coming in to be a part of our, our, of our, of our fellowship. You know, if you, if you can get in here without just about every pastor greeting you before you sit down, I would be shocked because that's part of what being a pastor is all about. It's part of being generous. It's part of being hospitable. I'm not great at that. I have to force myself to do that. I'm not a naturally hospitable person. So, you know, I have to kind of make myself do that. You know, Richard's a little bit better at dealing with people than I am, actually. Um, his police training has given him the ability to be able to interact with people um, kind of in a, in, a, in a little bit of a different way than I do. And so, you know, these, there's always things that we're working on, but, you know, part of desiring the office is striving to fit into these roles. And so it's always a constant effort and a work to kind of fit into these roles. So desiring to be hospitable. Apt to teach, and that word apt means to be skillful, not to be desiring of. There's plenty of people that desire to be teachers that are terrible at it. Just because you want to teach doesn't mean that you should. It's kind of like the whole kind of thing. It's kind of like if you, just because you desire to play drums doesn't mean that you should sometimes. Or just because you desire to lead worship doesn't mean that you should. Or just because you desire to be on safety team doesn't mean that you should, right? I mean, they're, they're, desire doesn't always meet up with all the things that need to happen. It's an important component. What you want is you want a person that desires to be, to be teaching and is good at it. That's what you really want. That's like, that's, that's the top tier of what you want. Sometimes you get people that desire to teach, but they're not really great at it, but because they desire to teach and nobody else is willing to teach, the desire is the thing that drives the person to be in the room teaching people. You ever been in a room and, and, and thought to yourself after you left there, man, I, I don't know if I really learned anything or not, or that was, that was dry, or that was, you know, boring, or, you know, I, what was that material all about anyways? You know, following rabbit trails or whatever, you know? If you've ever been in that situation, it's probably because you had a teacher that desired to be there, but he didn't have the skill to be able to teach, but nobody else wanted to teach, so he ended up in the room anyways. That's the equation, just so you know right? So that person that's teaching, that they're not really great at teaching, they have a little bit of grace, right? Because they desire to be there. You didn't. So suck it up. <laughs> so we go on. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, not given to wine, no striker. <laughs> There's that wine thing again, man. I'm telling you, man, they must have had a serious problem with drunks because it just keeps coming up, man. It's like, Sit in my chair for about a week and you'll see why. <laughs> yeah. Makes it easier. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Not given to wine, or in other words, not a drunker. Not a striker, which means to be contentious or quarrelsome. And if you add brawler to that at the end, you get this kind of idea of a non-contentious person either fighting with fist or sword. That's the way that Gill describes it. So, you know, you're not a person that desires to get into a fight. It's not like you're, you're looking or itching for a confrontation. That's another thing that I struggle with a lot of times. You know, philosophically, you know, I'm always looking for an argument. It's just kind of the way I am. I, got, I was able to go to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, kind of retreat for the local library community network thing or whatever, and I was asked to go, and so I went and sat in it, and there was these opportunities for us to exchange ideas about different things, and they were all coming up with these ideas, and, and, and one of the things that I just really love to do is I like to just take the counter-argument just for fun, and so, you know, I 
present these kind of weird ideas just for us to all fight about, and, and that's, that's the opposite of what a pastor should be doing, just to let you know. I mean, these are things that I'm working on, just like everybody's working on something, right? You know, so passing up on those opportunities to fight, passing up on those opportunities to be contentious, you know, being a little bit more absorbing of, of, of ideas without just out front, outright attacking someone for their ideas. You know, the, these are things that we, sh- we should be looking towards. Greed and ill-gotten gain. Covetousness can be placed into this one. So that word filthy lucre is just money or property that you have gotten via dishonesty. Um, and pastors should be above that. They really should. They really should be in a position to where they aren't doing anything financially or gaining anything financially uh, because of some kind of deceit or some kind of like criminal activity or, or just dishonesty. You know I mean? It's like, the, you know, writing a book and plagiarizing people, you know, or whatever the case may be. It's not like, you don't want to ever gain through wrongdoing uh, because it's just, it's, it's a bad look, Right? And it's, sometimes it's illegal. So I don't really have a whole lot to say about that because it's just like, it is what it is, right? Just don't be greedy, Richard. Okay? <laughs> don't gain stuff illegally because then you'll be fired from your other job too. <laughs> be patient. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, oh man, is it? Seems like a punishment to me. (laughs) Literally defined, it means bearing pains or trials calmly or without complaint. Manifesting forbearance under provocation or strain. You won't understand this until you're sitting in a meeting of people talking about how much you should get paid and someone sitting across from the table from you tells you that you should not be making more than the lowest paid person in the room. That'll give you an understanding of patience, forbearance. I have people tell me every week, you know, it's like, it's the running joke, you know, it's like, oh man, well, the pastor only works one day a week. Guess what? I don't think that's funny. But I laugh and I patiently endure it. But just to let you know, imagine if you had someone that was making fun of your job every week as a course of just conversation. Imagine how you would feel, right? There's a lot of things that people don't consider about the idea of being patient. It's like Tuesday, I have three meetings. At seven in the morning, I have my pastoral staff meeting with all of my pastors. We go straight from that to our prayer meeting at 9 a.m. So 7 a.m. starts the meeting for the pastors. 9 a.m. starts the prayer meeting. 9.30 typically that usually ends up being a little bit later, starts our all-staff meeting. And then after our all-staff meeting, I go right into our production meeting where we talk about our, our, you know, videos and our podcasts and all the things that are going on with that. And then typically all day long, there's just a constant stream of people coming into my office, just all day long, all day long, right? And so it's like trying to get this done while all that is happening, is just a test of patience. Sometimes people come into my office, and they'll be like the person that's coming in at three o'clock in the afternoon, and they'll knock on the door, and then I'll say, come in, and then they walk in, and I just kind of roll my eyes, and like, you know, or, you know it's, you have to understand that you're like the hundredth person, okay? That's, you just have to understand that and that I'm trying to patiently forbear it. And dealing with people 
is always an exercise of patience. All of you guys really should be taking note of this because patience is required for you guys as well. Like in this group of people, you guys are all sitting right on top of each other. There's a tendency probably to get hot. There's kids in the back that are making noise. There's all kinds of things that are kind of going on. I'm rambling on about junk. You know what I mean? It's like, it's an exercise of patience. You know, that person sitting next to you, they might be sitting a little bit too close or nudging you or whatever the case may be. And then you leave here and then somebody's gonna say something to you that's gonna offend you or I'm gonna say something. See what I mean? And, and somebody's gonna say something to, I'm gonna say something to offend you, you know, or whatever the case may be. And you're just gonna have to, you have to kind of just be able to patiently forbear that understanding that this person is your brother or your sister in Christ and you're just loving them through this thing that whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. The patience is what's important. It's patience that works your faith and brings about wisdom. And so... That's a pretty important one. Under provocation or strain. Not hasty or impetuous. That's a good word. You should look it up later. Steadfast despite opposition. That's a constant thing, man. It's like steadfast against opposition. If you know a direction that, you're, that, that you have to go, you just got to be steadfast moving in that direction. Sometimes people will start a ministry or they'll start a class or whatever and like two people will show up and they get discouraged and they're like, well, I guess we just need to close the class. And I'm just like, no, be steadfast. You just be consistent, keep moving. Always teach the same message. Always have the same idea. Just don't give up on your idea. Don't give up on what God's given you to do is what I should say. Be steadfast in your movement. That applies to your life. That applies to my life. That applies to everybody's life. That patience is important. Being steadfast and moving forward. Pressing towards the mark, the high calling of God. There's a reason why there's that word pressing, because it's a challenge. The reason that he says to take up my cross and follow after me is because, yes, his yoke is easy, but it's a yoke nonetheless. It's a burden. And it requires patience to work through it because the problem with being a part of a family of God is, is that you're part of a family of God. My dad used to always say, he used to say, man, a church would be great if there were no people in it. <laughs> a church of one is always easy to manage. But a church of one is not what God requires. This is what God requires. People coming together, worshiping in spirit and in truth with an under-shepherd guiding them and steadfastly pushing in the direction that we have to go. Steadfast, despite opposition, no matter what comes along, despite difficulty, despite adversaries, able or willing to bear the weight. Able or willing. The rates of pastors that suffer from nervous breakdowns is high. It's like in the 30th percentile. And the reason that happens is, is because unlike here, lots of churches view their pastor as a paid employee. They don't view them as a leader. In fact, a lot of times what you end up having in churches is you, have, you end up having entrenched elder boards or entrenched committees that have been there for 20 years that when the pastor comes in, they want to dictate to the pastor the direction of the church and just pay him to come up and speak every once in a while. It's completely unbiblical, it's completely unworkable, and it leads to the destruction of the pastor. What's amazing about this church is, is that you guys have trusted us to lead the congregation, and guys, we appreciate that trust, I'm telling you. It's not that common. Being patient. There's a lot to that. The household. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. <laughs> they were late this morning, right? <laughs> so they come driving up like 10 minutes after service has started. We've called and texted. Like, Richard, are you going to show up for your own ordination or what? 
And so they start walking in one at a time, so the boys come by first, and I was like, oh, you guys made them late, huh? And they, they all responded with the same answer. And then his daughter comes by, and she, I asked her, I said, oh, so you made them late, and she responded with an answer. Who do you suppose they said made them late? Who do you suppose? Do you want to hazard a guess? What? That's a smart answer. It is the incorrect answer. But it is a smart answer. They unanimously said mom. So we, we all have a question about leadership here right now. <laughs> really having your children in subjection with all gravity. Where gravity is a big deal, you know, because your children should respect you. Your children should have a level of respect for you that transcends respect that they have for other men. You know, a person that is ruling his household well doesn't have to ask for respect either. A man that is running his household according to the way that Christ prescribes that we run his household and he's living a Christ-like life, if you're doing that, you'll never have to ask for respect. You will never have to ask for someone to honor your authority. It's just natural that it's reciprocated. That's the way that it works. If you're trying it any other way, you're gonna fall flat on your face. It's one thing that, that, that I really look for when we're looking for a pastor is like, how is he running his household? And I'm not necessarily concerned so much with the individual behaviors of the children because that presents different challenges as well because you know, children are children. I don't care whose children that they are. You know, his children are no different than your children. My children are no different than your children. They're all children, and they all are apt to do wrong things. And one of the, one of the most terrible things about being a pastor is the unfair judgment against the pastor's children and wife, the expectations that are given. We had that a little bit when I first got here. You know, we had, you know, my kids would be out playing with all the other kids, and it became this thing, like if you tattled on the pastor's kids, they would always get in trouble. So they'd be all out there doing the same thing, but then invariably some kid would come in and say, hey, Gavin was doing this, you know, or whatever, and then somebody would go out and they would yell at Gavin without me knowing it. That ended pretty quickly because what I ended up doing was I ended up telling him, if you're going to tell on somebody's kid, what you need to do is you need to bring your parent with you. And, you need, and, the, and the parents need to be accountable for whatever is going on, whether it's my kids or whether it's your kids, it really doesn't make a difference, right? And what's interesting is, is that once that was down, once the kids knew that once they were going to tattle on them, they had to have their parents with them, guess what happened? Yeah, there was no more tattling. It ended pretty quickly. But there were people in the congregation that expected that my kids should act better than everybody else's kids. And guys, that's not realistic in any universe. In fact, one of the biggest tragedies of the pastor's family is the number of pastor's kids that end up falling away from the church because of the unfair expectations. I was one of them. I left the church because of the way that people treated me and their hypocrisy. It annoyed me. They would tell me that I would have to live a certain way because I'm the pastor's kid. Every time I got in trouble, I was reminded of the fact that I was a pastor's kid. You need to act this way and this way and this way. Meanwhile, this kid over here is doing the same thing that I'm doing. They're not even talking to him, right? You want to talk about, you want to talk about turning a child against Christ? That's, that's a really quick way to do it. And then wives as well, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, there's these, there's these expectations that, that wives of pastors, because they're called with their husbands to be the wives of pastors, should be the Sunday school teacher, and they should be the promotions director, and they should be the, you know, all the other little things that go along with that. And fortunately for us, we have a pastor's wife that is willing to do all of those things because she loves them. But they should be expected. I mean, it's like just because you're a pastor's wife doesn't mean that you should be a children's director leader, right? I mean, it's just like, it's just the same thing. Like, you know, if you, just because you have a desire to do something doesn't mean that you should. Or just because you have an expectation of doing something doesn't mean you should. That's just the negative aspect of it, right? But here's the thing. 
The reason that this is so important, the reason that he has to rule his family well with all gravity, gathering all of the respect that he gets because of the way that he lives his life, garnering his authority because of the person that he is in Christ, the reason that that is so important is because he will never make it without his wife. He'll never make it. There's many times where I come home and I'm just venting at Kim and she's just absorbing it, right? You guys think that all the stuff that trickles downhill through the church just accumulates on me? It's not just me, it's my wife as well. She bears that burden with me. It's a team effort. That's why this is so important. This part, guys, so important. Says, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So, not a novice. He can't be a newly convert. Can't be a newly newly planted Christian because you have to have this understanding that you are not God, and that your leadership position is not shepherd; it's under shepherd. And if you have that idea, what happens is you end up getting prideful. If you think of yourself as more than you are, you end up getting prideful. You end up getting conceited. You end up getting to think that you're more important than you really are. And I share this story a lot with people, man. One of the, the, the times that I was the most sickened, speaking with a group of pastors, a pastor told me that at some point when your church gets to a certain size, you have to leverage your celebrity. And I was just like, no, there's no such thing as a celebrity pastor. If you get to the point where you think that you're a celebrity and you're having to leverage your celebrity, you need to split your church and make two churches is what you need to do. Because there should never be an instance where the pastor thinks that he is the centerpiece of the church. I'm not the centerpiece of the church. Christ is the centerpiece of the church. And everything is directed at him. So being an under shepherd, it's important to understand that you're not the centerpiece because, and that takes not being a novice. You have to learn these things over time. And as you learn these things, what happens is you become humble. It, it, it's, 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 it's a humbling experience to learn what it means to lead a congregation of people, a congregation of, she, of sheep. To the world, we must have good report to them whether, which are without lest we fall into reproach. You have to have a good reputation. Your reputation is so important. What people in the community think about you is so important. What type of person are you? Are you contentious? Do people not want to talk to you because you're contentious? Do they see you as a valuable leader? Do they see you as a compassionate leader? Do they see you as a leader or a pastor of a church? Or do they see you as a hypocrite? These are things that you have to deal with. We do a lot of networking here. A lot of the stuff that I do is networking with other churches and networking with other community, networking with the library to try and get a, a, a handhold and being able to work with them as well. These are all things that we're doing all the time. And when I go to these meetings, I want to make sure that I leave there them thinking that was a nice experience. That was a good experience. I'll never lie to them, and I'll never candy coat stuff, but when I leave there, I want them to leave knowing that I care about them. And so I'll do that. I'll walk around, and I'll thank them. I'll say, thank you for letting me be here today. I really, I really enjoyed this, and I love you. Because it's true. Respect, possibly Fear. As an under-shepherd, one of the things that you do, and we're going to talk about this, one of the things that you do is protect the flock. So look, look at this poor guy, right? <laughs> that guy is suffering right there. I mean, that's a sheep that has been neglected. The poor guy. This was a famous story because they res rescued this guy and then they, they, um, they, they sheared him. And man, when they sheared him, man, his skin was red and he was just all beat up. And yeah, it was a pretty sad story. But this is what under shepherds do. And I got this actually off of Job Chronicles, which is a jobs website online. And so this is the way they describe an, a, an under shepherd or a shepherd doing, right? So they watch the master sheep. They say they're responsible for the safety and the welfare 
of the sheep. Do you know sheep will go into a pasture and they'll just eat anything, whether it's poisonous or not? So one of the things that the shepherd would do is he would go into the field and he would kind of kick things out or he would pick up things or he would move things that would be dangerous for the sheep to eat because they'll just eat everything in sight. That's what God describes you guys as. Congratulations. It is true, though. I have seen Christians, they will just absorb whatever teaching is laying on the ground. Just doesn't matter what it is. Some kind of false prophecy kind of nonsense or some kind of ecumenical kind of nonsense or some kind of like weird interpretation of the Bible or some kind of new like idea that's resurfaced, like, new, like, like some kind of like new resurgence of, of the way that, that salvation works or whatever the case may be. There's always all these things sprouting up for people to absorb. And part of what we do here is go before you and safeguard what is being brought into the pasture here for the sheep to feed on. It's a big part of what we do. Greg and, and, and these guys and Ken, I mean, they're always like just looking over material and questioning material and looking up mission agencies and looking up different work groups that we can work with. It's just part of what we do. The safety and the welfare of our flock. Sourcing water, finding places for them to drink. Protection from predators, coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, bears, domestic dogs. Part of what we do is we protect what's going on here. We all have like superpowers, right? Richard's superpower is the ability to be logical about all things. Doesn't matter what it is, right? You can be talking about somebody's marriage relationship. He's got it calculated out to a calendar event, right? It's got it all lined out, outlined. It's like, okay, that's what it is. Greg's superpower, he can love you no matter what. I, he, absolutely. He can, like, no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, no matter what you smell like, no matter what, he's going to hug you, he's going to love you, he's going to pour out his heart to you, you're going to feel like he's your grandpa. That's just like the, the way that, that's his superpower. Ken's superpower is, is he's capable of writing anything and organizing anything. And he can call people and convince them to do things. I don't know how he does it. Like, before we started doing the podcast, I would call up guests and I would ask them to come on and they'd be like, oh, well, you know, whatever. And then when Ken started doing it, it's just like the lineup just kept coming. You know, it's like, I don't know how he does it. My superpower, I could detect evil people instantly. Greg will tell you, over the course of the history of this church, when somebody entered into the church that I knew needed to be marked and removed, I tell him immediately, and there have been times where he's like, no, come on, that's not, no, come on. Ended up being true. Yep. I have a spirit of discernment for those things that God's gifted me with, and all of those things that God's gifted us with, we use to protect the flock. We use to protect you guys. Because we care about you. We want to lead you to places where you can get good water, lead you to places where you can pasture and have good food. We want to care for your health and welfare. Did you know that sheep never shed? They're not like your dog. They never shed. They never naturally shed off their wood. They must be sheared. That's how this guy got here. Nobody was shearing him. I thought that was interesting. I didn't know that. What does that shearing look like? You know, it's like pulling off that weight that it just keeps growing and accumulating. Every person that's sitting in this room right now, you have something in your life that is accumulating on your shoulders. And it's part of our jobs to help you shed those things, understanding that it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what you've done, that Jesus Christ loves you and there's no condemnation living under the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be freed of your condemnation. You can be freed of your doubt. You can be freed of your worry because Jesus Christ loves you. And as you mature in your faith, you're going to find that you're going to become burdened less and less with those things as you learn and as you mature and as you listen. You're going to be sheared more often and you're going to be living a freer, cooler, more comfortable life 
because you're coming and you're being here and you're being sheared off of all those burdens that keep coming along. What Richard is being called to, guys, and I always ask him, you know, because like, I, always, I always give a guy, you know, my, our requirement is like a year. I think you have to be a, an intern for a year, and then we can ordain you as a pastor. I always wait way longer than that, though, because I want you to be sure. I want you to know. I don't want you to make a commitment to God that you're then going to break because it just wasn't for you. And I have sat with Richard for five years and watched him work and watch him do things and trying to couple that with raising a family and doing a full-time job as well. It's amazing. So we're going to do two things here before we dismiss. First thing is I'm going to have Richard come up and his wife. Let's get a seat for his mom too. The kids can stand. Rodney, thank you. Oh, never mind. Richard, Richard's got it. Amen. Thank you. You raised him right, Southern man. Yep. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. So. <laughs> this captain will need some context, though, because. Because why? I'm sitting between two women. <laughs> What, what are you talking about? I don't even understand what you're talking about. Yeah. So you're, you're weird. I might be changing my mind. I'm just logical. I can't <laughs> the logic is pouring out. I, these guys are now going to face challenges, right? They, they've been doing the job, but once you're ordained and once you move on into full-time service and once... You, this is a lifestyle. That's why I call it a full-time service. It's a lifestyle. It, it's, it is your identity. And um, I'm just really thankful for men who dedicate themselves to that and the women that are responsible for, for putting him there. And that's why we always bring up their family because, because honestly, there's no way that he could be sitting here today getting this certificate and being ordained without the two women that are sitting beside him. Right? So let's give them a hand, first of all. So I'm going to ask our pastors to come up and I'm going to ask our deacons to come up. Come on up, guys. Pastors, deacons, whoever's in the room. Should be a few of them. Oh, you got the cream of the crop. Where's Roger at? Oh, he's coming second service? You didn't get Roger. He didn't feel like it was important. Oh, there's Roger. Hey, come on in, Roger. Roger. Come on up. <laughs> we're going to lay hands on these guys and we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for Richard in particular and <clears throat> ordain him to the service. This is the calling. This is the time set apart for ministry. This is a big deal. And uh, I'm just thankful, Richard, for everything you do. You know? And like these guys, all these guys, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is the heartbeat of the church. This is, this, is where it all, this is where it all happens. These guys just giving their lives to Christ. And um, we're really thankful for that. So Richard, God bless you, buddy. Thank you. Roger, you want to start us off? Lord, we are so grateful that um, you have allowed us to be servants of yours. Thank you for a church that promotes 
your uh, biblical principles. Preach at your word and, and hold us accountable for that standard. Thank you for Richard and his ministry and his heart for the gospel. Pray that you will bless him, bless his family, that you will protect and guide them. Lord, that you will uh, keep their marriage strong, keep their family strong, and uh, keep them in your word. We just uh, thank you for him and, and just pray a blessing over him. Father, we are so grateful that you brought Richard to us and his family and friends. We are a great witness to the rest of us. Lord, allow that witness to shine through for everyone that comes through that door. Father, we know that um, challenges come upon us. We see that. We feel it. Let that strength be in Richard's armor. We let him just be able to push that away with your strength, Father. We just ask you to guide this way. Lord, I thank you for Richard today. Thank you for his boldness. Thank you that you planted your word in his heart. I thank you that you give him a mouth to preach it without reservation, without apology. Father, I pray that you protect his man in the days ahead. That you be with him there in the secret place, in the doubt, the fears, the fatigue, the temptations come. I pray that you remind him with all of your power why you called him and what it is you want him to do. Mm. Help him, Lord, in the weak days ahead, the dark days ahead, and the difficult days ahead, to remain strong, always with your people, in his foremost mind, and that you may be glorified mm. through his body and in your work in him and through him. Father, it's, we've spent the last hour laying out his duties. And uh, Father, as we now put him in the service, we ask, Father, that this congregation would look upon him as a brother and as a leader, and that this congregation would be his support team, along with his wife and his mother and his family. And we lift him up to you, Father. They will be attacked. Yeah. This is a position that uh, puts him uh, out in, in front. He will be vulnerable. His family will be vulnerable. But, Father, with this congregation behind him, we can attack. We can support. We can fight off any of Satan's demands upon his life. So, Father, help us to be mindful of that. Help us to continue to uh, watch over him and his family, uh, especially his kids, uh, that uh, they may be raised up in, uh, in, a, in a situation, a family situation, where they love you. And, uh, Father, that is our prayer today. So give us the strength to do that. Guide and direct us in this. And each one of us has a part in this, Father. Help us to not forget that as we uh, put him... Uh, in, into harm's way, so to speak. Uh, but Lord, we will be there for him. We will guide, we will direct, and we will support our brother. Heavenly Father, I lift up the Alderson's family to you, Lord. We know what this, what happens when strong men step up and have courage and speak out. So, I want to pray for this whole body, this whole flock, to not only support him and encourage him, but to be the ones that lift him up if he stumbles. Mm -hmm. To be the ones that are his support so that he can carry out the mission that you have gifted him with, Lord. We know that there's going to be attacks spiritually, and I just humbly pray that we all can get together and kneel down and pray for that protection. Pray for, um, for the Aldersons so that those attacks that come do not go so deep that they can deflect them and that they can shield them off. And I just um, pray for the kids, for all three of the Alderson kids, that they can also have some of that protection, Lord, because we know that the devil will attack wherever he, he can find the most weakness. And I know that that would be something for my family. It would be hard and challenging if, 
the devil was attacking my children, Lord. So I just pray that we can all keep the entire family in our prayers, Lord. Father, I am humbled to be able to serve with all of these men. Father, I'm thankful for the Aldersons, for their stand, for their courage, for their diligence, for their steadfastness. Father, I pray for my brother Richard now as he undertakes this endeavor, this lifelong calling, that you will not only protect him, but that you would embolden him to continue to speak the word of truth without apology, to be able to care for those of the flock, to protect them, to guide them, to love them, and to sacrifice for them. Father, we give you all the glory for everything that you have done, are doing, and are going to do in the lives of this family and the life of my brother, Richard Alderson. And we give you all the glory for it. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And Richard, if you guys will stand. On behalf of Athel Baptist Church, the ordaining council, and the church council, I present you with this certificate of ordination from Athel Baptist Church. And thank you so much, man. Love you. Love you guys. Yay, somebody take a picture. Oh, there you go. Take a picture. Oh. Okay. Right. Hey, don't you guys just uh, go back to the back and stand at the door. Y'all make sure that y'all go by and give these guys a hand of fellowship and uh, encourage them in the work. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Uh, let's pray, and we'll have our worship band come up. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for everything that you've accomplished, God. You're just, um, just so amazing in how you bless our lives. And Father, we have now one more person, one more man ordained to carry out the work of pastor in our community. And I pray that you would utilize this to the best of our abilities, that we would bring God honor and glory to you. Father, as we move forward into the unknown, let our message not change, let our strength not falter, let our desires not be sated, and let our, 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 our desire to make noise only increase as time goes on. Father, I pray that you would that you would bless our congregation, that you would strengthen our bond of love as we are going to need it. And I will give you all the glory for it. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen.